quite frankly, I didn't realize how much what happened to me as a child translated into my marriage. For instance, I never wanted to have children because at the time I felt the only way to keep my child from being hurt was to not have them because people just hurt children. And I translated that. I, I could see a, a, a dad hugging their daughter and it just, it um, triggered me. And going back to that incident of just crying uncontrollably, it took a while for them to, to calm me down. Um, and the scariest thing is not knowing why you're in the condition you're in. I went to go see somebody from our employment assistant program and they, they, they helped, but they weren't really, I was scared to give too much information because I was scared it was gonna get back to my bosses. And I was in an executive position at that time. And a lot of times when we're in an executive position or, or trying to achieve that goal, we, we don't want to do anything to make us look weak. We don't want to do anything to make people look down on us. So I just kept masking it. I finally opened up to a pastor and he just told me that I needed to pray more. I needed to fast more, you know, Christians, we don't we don't have these issues. If I'm a good Christian, then I should be able to get over it. I came back a couple of weeks later. I opened up a little bit more about the molestation. And he just said, you know, it it happened when you were a child, you're a grown woman now. You should just be able to get over it. And unfortunately, what I found is People that suffer from childhood trauma, it doesn't go away until we deal with it. Um, a lot of times, as I know in my own life, as I matured, as I grew, I thought, if I just keep it all together, if I'm really successful, if I appear to be happy, then those flashbacks, that feeling of being a victim will go away. And unfortunately, it's kind of like um, trying to patch a, a dam with tape. You know, it, it may be a temporary fix, but at some point that the, the dam is going to give way because the tape isn't strong enough to hold it. And it's the same in my life, at least. And in, in a lot of the young people that I talk to that are struggling with childhood trauma, they feel that if I can just not talk about it, if I can just not deal with it, it'll just go away. And in my own life and in the lives of those that I've ministered to, it you will find it just doesn't work that way. We, we have to get past that. It's, my marriage suffered. My friendships suffered. Um, intimacy between myself and my husband suffered. It, it was just a lot of... Um, suffering and I don't want to say it's unnecessary suffering but there it could have been a, a better degree of suffering until if I had gotten help sooner I I could have gotten over a lot of things that I, I just didn't want to deal with and then there was the issue of anger I was a very angry person I would fight at the drop of a hat I didn't care if you were female or male I, I was just always, always angry. Um, I am sorry if you can hear background noise. I'm at the hospital with my brother and people are walking by. Um, it's clear. It's clear, actually. We can't get here. We can't hear the noise. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, I walked around angry and it didn't take that much to make me angry. And a lot of it was because I had not dealt with what had happened when I was a kid. And as I grew and I got the help that I need and I finally started to, I, I God bless me with a Christian um, psychiatrist and therapist that helped to walk me through that process of dealing with that because I hated my mother's side of the family. I mean, literally hated them. I, you could, 
I mean, I don't know if anybody has ever had the kind of anger where you could just mention a person's name and all the floodgates of anger and hate would just come up. And that's a very miserable place to live in. And it took a really long time for me to get to a place where I could let that go, where I could, I, I'm not going to let them have that kind of power over me anymore. I, I need to get free of this. And one of the ways to get free of it was, yes, I, I wholeheartedly believe that we need to pray and that we need to go to church and we need to get the faith aspect of it. I'm, I'm, I'm working ministry, so I very much agree with that. But I also feel that God has blessed us with people that are professionals, people that he has gifted with the skill of counseling and therapy and insight into the mind that we, we have to let those people help us. And I think that in, at least in the a faith environment, we're, we're kind of told that we need to not go there. We don't need to talk to professionals. We need to just pray more, fast more, and it'll fix itself. And, and I'm living, I'm a living witness that that is not the case. Um, I don't want to talk over my time, so I don't, I don't know if you, you know, if you want me to say any more or not. Wow. Well, it's always a pleasure to share with you, Shell. And I'm very happy we are joined by Yinka Perry. Maybe you can just, if you can't put on your <laughs> video, you can <laughs> just put that emoji that you're in here. Yes, now that, you, you, you can see Shell there. Uh, we have, oh, Yinka, wow. Are you in the same state or you're in different states? No, we're in the same state. Mm -hmm. Same state, right. And Shell, that's a sacrifice. I know where you are. And uh, you are in our prayers, your family as well. And thank you, thank you for thank being you. that generous and vulnerable to share with us about your childhood trauma and specifically what we are very ashamed of talking about in Africa, sexual abuse in childhood. We also have Dr. Rosa Gediora. Rosa, how are you? <laughs> yeah, she's also joining Hi, us thank you. from the USA and she was with us the other day. Susan Jeroge, welcome. Uh, we do have two Susan Jeroges. We have Tracy Mathenge, Virginia. Uh, for the people who have joined in, I will share with you uh, that video uh, about my sister, Shell, who lives in the USA. And, uh, she shared about her violence and how that sexual violence changed her life, even in adulthood. And she said one very powerful statement. The only way to be able to resolve this is to actually deal with it. So don't run away from it. So those of you who have listened to her, I'm sure you may have a question or two before we go to the next speaker who is already in the house. But maybe to read for you her bio, uh, Shell Fredo is founder and president of her faithvillage.com ministries, an international ministry for women and youth. She also founded its daughter ministries, herbiblestudies.com, herfaithradio.com, keeping it real in Christ.com, uh, her village faith gatherings, and her women's hub community. Shell has appeared on TBNs. We all know about TBN, most of us here. Praise the Lord. She has also authored dozens of Bible studies used by churches, ministries, and youth groups, spoken at numerous events, and holds annual women's youth and conferences and retreats. I can't wait to host her in Kenya. We are trusting God if it's not in Kenya, we're going to have it maybe somewhere else in Africa. Shell shares her contemporary messages from real life experiences 
and practical biblical principles, Cheryl not only draws her audiences into a deeper awareness of God, she shows them how to walk more intimately with him day by day. Her conversational style of speaking and the ability to make you laugh out loud while Amen. taking a closer, a close look at yourself makes Amen. you feel that you're listening to a good friend. Amen. Our messages are thought-provoking, life-changing, genuine, and most of all, Christ-centered. Her presentations flow from her desire to help people get real about their walk with Christ or lack thereof. Drawing from the abundance of what she has learned as a wife, a survivor of sexual and physical abuse, being raised by a single mother, working uh, in corporate America, and the continual struggle against self and capital letters for self, S-E-L-F, Shell truly identifies with women and youth on many different economic, social, and spiritual levels. So that's Shell who was just speaking to us. And right now she's in the hospital. I want to imagine she's there taking care of her mother. So keep her mom in prayer. I believe all of us raising a voice, a compassionate prayer to God because she can still make time for us. Uh, I'm really humbled, Shell. And my prayer is that whatever you've done today, because I'll share your video to all the participants, will not go to waste. It's going inspire, to inspire someone or even inspire many through the one that I'm going to share that video with. So members who are in before, uh, we had Susan Jeroge, we have Nora, uh, we had Rosa Jamvia. Oh, we have Jamvia Mohike from uh, Rwanda. Thank you for coming. We have Zachary here, we have Ian, we have Emmanuel. And I see Nora's hand, it has been there. Nora, Nora, you wanna ask something? You wanna comment? I want to ask actually. Uh -huh. So thank you, Shell, for being vulnerable with us, strangers. So my, I have two questions. When you are experiencing all that, like, did you have maybe siblings or did you ever talk to your mom? Then um, I would really love to know how these experiences impacted your relationship, your day-to-day -day relation, relationships with people, with uh, because where, when you first talk to someone, when you talk to someone who's in an EAP office, so how was your relation with, with your colleagues in such in such a state? Thank you. Um, I'll answer the first one first. I really didn't talk to my mom until after I had gotten help. Um, I was scared one to talk to my mom. To um, I felt that it was my fault that all of these things happened to me. And so I was kind of scared to go to her. But once I started to reach out, she found out by accident um, that I had gotten molested. And it was because I had walked in on her in an intimate moment and I freaked out because I thought the person was hurting her. And I was so not okay that she was like, what's wrong with you? And I told her, but that was a very, um, when I spoke with her, it was very surface. I didn't really go into details. I didn't want to talk about it. And it stayed a, a, a dark subject for us. We didn't, we just didn't discuss it. Once I started to get help, then I realized, okay, I need to talk to my mom. I need to let her know. And the really funny thing about all of this is once I started to tell her what all had happened to me, how I felt, what happened to me at work, I came to find out that my mom all these years felt like it was her fault that these things happened to me because she didn't know. So yet again, somebody else is going through trauma and I don't even know it because of the trauma that was done to me. 
Um, as far as how it impacts how I minister to women, is that what you're asking me? No, um, like you said, you worked in an executive position. So I, I imagine oh. you know, you worked in an organization. How did it impact? Did it impact your relationship with your colleagues or other people? Um, it didn't impact my relationship with my supervisors. However, it did impact my relationship with my coworkers. Um, in the in the respect that I felt that everybody knew. I felt that everybody was judging me. I felt shame. I felt like what's going to happen if they find out all the details. So in that respect, it did impact to the degree that I left that particular company. Um, no one ever came up to me and bashed me. Um, my the first person I went to did share some some information with my supervisors, and that was devastating. But my supervisor, um, a wonderful lady by the name of um, Victoria, she um, she came to me thinking she was consoling me when she wasn't because I I didn't want her to know that. So she was very loving toward me. I just didn't take it toward as loving. Does that make sense? Wow. How, how did you interpret that, Shell? Quite powerful. Say that one more time. Mm -hmm. Can you, I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat what you said? You, you were like, uh, you didn't see her loving. Instead, what did you see? What did you feel? Um, for me, I saw it as she she found out something I definitely didn't want her to know. I felt that she was going to judge me. I felt that she was trying to shame me. And it was only in hindsight that I realized that she was just trying to let me know she cared. But because I had so much shame about what was going on with me, I just felt like I wanted to, I hate to say this word, but that's what I felt. I just felt like I wanted to die because I just couldn't believe that my psychiatrist had told her what I told them. So it took a while for me to get out of that place through this, the second therapist that I went to help me to get delivered from all of that stuff. Cause uh, you know, the bad thing about childhood trauma is it, it does give shame as part of the trauma. So you tend to just walk around all the time feeling that shame and that you want everything to stay hidden and buried and you don't want anybody to know. And the actual shame sometimes is what keeps us from getting the resources that we need to get delivered from all of that. Wow. So people can even shun uh, helpers, you know? I, I, I yes. like the way you, you, you are like tracking these with your own personal experiences and matching that with what is already investigated it's evidence best uh explanations mm -hmm. that this is what childhood trauma can do to someone and can impact uh their relationships with other people i see dr rosa there with her hand up maybe she wants to ask a question or comment yes dr rosa hello dr susan hello Thank you, uh, Ms. Shelley. I just wanted to ask what whether you work with employee resource groups um, as concerns human resources with organizations that you may be interacting with as concerns the trauma that individuals um, encounter, especially with Title IX issues, you know, women being assaulted or harassed in the workplace environment. 
And of course, we carry ourselves into the workplace environment. So I'm wondering whether you work with any of those groups to see how we can better assist in that um, area specifically. I don't work directly with those groups. We, um, I think Yinka, I heard Dr. Susan say that Yinka had come on. Uh, Yinka and I are putting together something here in the States to do that very thing. Um, I Usually when I work with women, it's to get them the resources that they need. I'm not usually the bridge between the resources and myself. I'm usually the bridge between the woman and ministry, the woman and, Christ, and her Christian faith. So what it looks like is a woman comes to me who has been damaged, whether it is by physical abuse or uh, sexual abuse, whether it's the abuse that is happening currently or has happened in the past. We work with her to try to get her in a better place to where she will even receive help because that's a whole nother issue. You know, sometimes people know they need help, but they're not in a place to go and get that help. So I come in and I say, okay, let's, let's work through this. Let's work through it from a Christian perspective, but understanding that the ultimate goal is to get you professional help. And I, I can't, reiterate that enough that all of the programs that we have that are professional programs are great. All of the ministry programs are great, but God has gifted counselors and therapists and psychiatrists. And those are the people that I really try to get them um, connected with. Thank you so much, Ms. Shelley. So Rosa, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you have just shared, I guess it's good for you to uh, introduce a little bit more of what you are doing now in the States so that you can get the two ladies connecting with you in the US. We have Yinka Perry there and now you have known Shan. Kindly, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, my name is Dr. Rosa Githi, or I wish to thank Dr. Susan Gitau for um, inviting me to this um, P2F uh, launch, you know, following the launch, and uh, for serving as my mentor, life mentor, and um, my friend, my family, my, you know, um, individual who is trying to help me process different things. I... Uh, obtained my primary and secondary and tertiary um, education in Kenya um, from Loreto Convent Valley Road to Loreto Convent Msongari. And then after that, um, Alliance Francais, when we wound up with some conflict within the country due to elections, uh, I had to stop my French studies. Once things calmed down, I started my law program at the KSPS um, in Nairobi. And once I completed that, um, I got accepted at St. Francis University in Loreto, Pennsylvania. And I studied criminal justice and sociology because my interest was in criminal procedure and criminal law, um, starting from KSPS in Kenya. Um, once I completed that, I worked with juveniles um, in a juvenile facility near the university. There was also a maximum prison with uh, adult individuals. I then completed my degree in 2003 and started working with refugees from Somalia and others from Liberia, and then eventually with DRC. Um, it is the, at that point that I realized I was kind of following the path of both my parents. I have two siblings, an elder sister who is in clinical research and a younger sister who is in grants management. And my mother is a human rights advocate for girls and women. And my father is in the military and trains the military on military procedures, concerns humanitarian law and human rights. So I was following both paths. Uh, my mother also worked in criminal justice within the courts as a probation officer and worked with street children. So 
understanding that empathetic piece as to how children understand the world and then how they grow into it was vital to me and very important to where I'm at. Um, once I completed that, I started my master's degree, went back into corrections, but on a research level and trying to see what works within the federal system, the US system, the state system, as concerns the programming to reintegrate individuals who have been incarcerated. Um, once uh, that was the research piece that I was doing and we built a what works library on that as concerns the services for employment, education, substance abuse, uh, mental health challenges and so on. Um, once I started my um, PhD program, it was in urban policy and public affairs. And my dissertation was on female circumcision as a cultural practice um, that works within policy within the United States among African immigrants. I had to be very specific because I was getting individuals from other countries like Iraq and Yemen and so on. And I needed to just focus on Africa. Um, I did the case study interviewed individuals about why they still believe in the practice. And what I wanted to understand is whether they understand the laws and the protocols of the host country where they've been moved to. So the Somali individuals or individuals from other countries where there's conflict and they still have a belief in this practice. And so what's your understanding of the law and then is the law understanding you? So you know that it's symbiotic and of course, um, I found that it was not. Um, continued that work into diversity, equity and inclusion at the University of Akron, where I stayed for about 18 years and then proceeded to the University of Georgia where I headed um, the multicultural department and also at Toledo and Case Western Universities respectively. I'm now going to be doing the same, but in a Title IX capacity at the University of Akron again um, here shortly. Uh, so that is my background. Thank you, Dr. Susan. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. I can see Shell saying you guys shall connect. Very nice. Uh, I know you will form a very powerful pact there. <laughs> Yeah, so you can inbox her your your email address, your contacts. My prayer is that some of us will also come to these events you will be planning. And my desire is that we will do more of these uh, presentations and empowerment for people back home. Uh, Yinka, would you like to say hello? Would you like to, to do a comment? before we go to our next uh, speaker? Uh, not much for me to add. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just am happy to be a part of this uh, presentation and I'm looking forward to joining forces with uh, Dr. Rosa and continued, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Planning with uh, Shell, okay. as well as you. Whenever you have something, just call. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I call her my sister. We've been with uh, Perry, uh, Perry to South Africa. We founded uh, Global African Mental Health Network. And uh, for sure, we can say we, this far, the Lord is Ebenezer. When, when you try something and you want to be a blessing back home, that's the spirit that uh, uh, Yinka Perry has and uh, Shell and others. Uh, one of us right now in Japan, um, Professor Goris, uh, and others who might be joining us if we give them more opportunities to share with us. We still agree that here in uh, in, in Africa, we're still growing in uh, practical mental health uh, practice and service delivery. And so you, your presentations, your sharing of resources is highly welcome. Exchange of, of knowledge 
Uh, Rosa was very instrumental in some of the community volunteer services we've been doing here in Kenya. For the last six months, we visited with her uh, to Rwanda. Jamvia here, is he still in the house? Jamvia, yes, you remember Rosa? She's back in the States. So, yes, and yes. Uh, yeah. We actually have a training in uh, Rwanda and Javier Mohiri here is uh, is one of the M hub mental health hub uh, Rwanda but also uh, trained in mindful self compassion. We are looking at the many pains uh, we have in Africa and we are like sometimes it may not be that one touch sometimes it may not be um possible to access the services of a professional mental health uh, service provider. And in our uh, uh, trying to ensure that everybody receives some basic mental health services, we are trying to groom and build community health volunteers. And mindful self-compassion cuts across. If it is delivered in the language uh, that the people at the low level can understand the grassroots or the lay counselors, then we would be able to help as many Africans as possible. Because truth be told, trauma can block somebody's self-actualization tendencies. And that is huge in Africa. And so we are seated here in Africa waiting for all sort of help. It's like we think our brain cannot function. And uh, we have a lot of issues that we think are big issues. But like Shell said, deal with it. Deal with it. Like face it. It might have been shameful. It might have been painful. But deal with it. Deal with it. Yes, she says she acknowledges when you have specialists working with you. When you have counselors, therapists, spiritual uh, maybe uh, leaders who have training in mental health. And uh, Yinka, I know one time we will give her an opportunity. She's an amazing presenter as well. We did a wonderful job in South Africa uh, last year, but one. And uh, I believe we are getting there day by day. Yinka, we are getting there. Yes, in the next, uh, yeah, <laughs> we did it, we did it. Um, in the next uh, maybe one hour, unless there's a question, a comment, for those that listened to uh, Shell, maybe Zachary, Janvia, or Francis, I'm calling out the men in the house, <laughs> just in case they have something to comment before we go on. Can see Alan there. Can see Ian. Anyone with a comment, a question? Uh, thank you, Madam Susan. This is uh, Zachary. Mm -hmm. That was very powerful. And I listened to the talk and uh, I felt like uh, it is so important to integrate counseling and, uh, and spirituality. Uh, it seems like it was very hard for the presenter, uh, Shell, uh, to get the, the grip of herself before visiting uh, some of the specialists. But I also felt like uh, uh, her fears were actually offloading. And at the same time, there was that element of uh, lack of confidentiality uh, feeling that uh, there was a bit, there could be a betrayal, having visited some of the uh, professionals, but it is good that uh, when she talked to uh, a pastor, she got at least the courage to be able to face the world and uh, go down on uh, prayers and onto her knees, pray and pray, and got herself into a unit. It's so powerful, and I really understood that. 
and I feel so happy that uh, it is important for us also to understand that even as we do our work of counseling, we also really need to ensure that we integrate a lot of uh, spirituality, spirituality into it as we try to achieve at least the whole sameness of a person. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to say a word. Thank you so much. Yes, Zachary uh, Uruko is a member of uh, Susan Gitao Counseling Foundation as a board member and helps us a lot, especially in the community outreach. Uh, Shell and Yinka, you, you remember what we did um, for Shakahola. Uh, Zachary uh, Oruko is the one helping the family back in the village because he's the one who is um, a few kilometers to that homestead. When I took him there, He's been doing that work. And right now we still have a challenge because the DNA results are coming out in piecemeal. And um, the family lives very far. It's like from one corner of the country to the other corner. And it's very expensive for the family to keep visiting the coast of Kenya from the west of, of Kenya. But we thank God even for the way we joined hands, Shell, and Yinka and uh, Professor Goris in absentia uh, to have that amazing training for the community health volunteers. Uh, if we can document what we've been doing together, it's it's a lot. We may think like we are not doing something, but we are doing something. So Shell's story, and those of you that didn't watch her video, I'm going to share it uh, with you. Uh, and share this recording as well. An amazing, amazing woman of God. And she has chosen to use her pain to be fruitful. And that is the hallmark of this pay, painful to fruitfulness uh, mental health talk show. That how can I turn my pain into fruitfulness? Just like the Christians who are in here celebrating uh, Jesus Christ, that through the death on the cross, shameful death on the cross, trauma has shame. Trauma is painful. We have received salvation. And so even for this mental health talk show, we are basically telling everyone who has gone through pain that can turn into fruitfulness, but deal with it, face it. So uh, allow me to usher in the next speaker. Uh, is a very young person. You, you can hear a story from a senior person. And now we have one from a young person, um, an amazing daughter, I call her my daughter. Uh, very many people don't know how she became my daughter. And uh, it's not been an easy journey, but I, I, I thank God. Just like Shell has said, sometimes you want to tell the whole world about someone, but you do not want to say it, lest it compromises some safety measures. Uh, but they can tell it themselves. Uh, in this country, Yinka and Shell, if you could, if you could Google and Jamvia, maybe and Dr. Rose, if you could Google uh, on 16th of March, we lost a young person. And that young person, uh, I did not know him before the death announcement, but he has really moved me and touched me and uh, changed my way of thinking about many things. Um, yet, I think we have remained in, in a very uh, closed up space, especially in Africa. And instead of trying to take a journey of understanding people, their pain, where they are coming from, there's a lot of social media hate that has been uh, spread. And sometimes you find the people that are hit, if you and I at our level, 
we can experience the heat of social media hate. What about the young ones who are yet to learn uh, through some of the experiences in life to be resist, uh, to be resistant, to be resilient, to be compassionate? It's not an easy journey. So we lost a 23-year-old TikToker uh, who used to vibe and uh, brighten up the lives of many people, especially the young people, uh, including some political leaders in the country saying, we have lost someone that you could just tune in and uh, you laugh because of what he was saying. But there's a boy who had a lot of pain in his life, a lot of pain, losing a mother at the age of eight years, going all the way to be adopted by an auntie who also loses her life and leaves two, two young uh, boys that... Uh, that were his cousins. Now he was raising the cousins. He was raising himself. He was raising the grandmother. But the best way he could like make money was through social media. And we know very many young people are making money through the social media platform. And sometimes uh, what can sell because you need that money. Sometimes that's what they give. And it, it's social media platform sometimes is a large following ship without a shepherd. And so there's, there's a lot of discussion uh, that is going through my mind, it's going through my heart, that is there a way we can inject compassion into social media community and the families there so that we can reduce the social media hate, we can reduce the homophobia hate, we can reduce stigma and discrimination such that people can feel safe. It's not easy, but I've always said that in Africa, even when things are meant to be very hot and very, very uh, difficult, the Ubuntu spirit <laughs> can still work for Africa. And so allow me at this moment to invite uh, Virginia Njoki, maybe after she finishes her presentation, she gives me permission. <laughs> I can say uh, a lot about her. And I met this young girl when she was informed to, and she was leading in the church, uh, praise and worship. And uh, she, I asked a question. The whole church was there. It was a family day. And she answered a question that majority of the people there were not able to answer. And I told her, this is what I do everywhere I go. I pick up someone, I pick someone. So I told her, I would like for you once you finish your form form, kindly make sure that you reach out to me. I give uh, the guardian my number, but I never saw her for a long, long time. So maybe I thought she finished, went to university, went far away. But now how I got to meet her again, uh, she was introduced to me by well-wishers, the church members, and I was there telling them, this is the girl I had met when she was very young. Uh, now you bring her to me, and in the, the way you bring her to me, I receive her, I embrace her. It's never easy. Sometimes that's the way the world is. We bring you someone, and we live with that someone. And the rest you can deal with God. So allow me to usher in Virginia Njoki. And my prayer is that God will keep uh, raising her. God will keep also educating her. God will keep protecting her. And God will use her to be a voice to very many young people that suffer silently. And even maybe when they want to raise a voice, uh, no one is ready to listen. So welcome, Virginia and Joki. Asante, karibu sana. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you 30 minutes and then we can have 30 minutes of interactions. Thank you so much, Dr. Susan. It is an opportunity. I'm very much humbled. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Virginia and Joki Wanjiku. I'm a youth leader at our church, that is pre-CEA a modeling trainer, also a student at Africana College of Professions, 
and also a volunteer counselor at Dr. Susan Getau Counseling Foundation. Uh, this evening, I'm going to take you uh, on the way on how losing a parent often takes a troll on a child because uh, right now, having realized myself and being at this age, I lost my parent back uh, in 2010. That, uh, that year I was in class two, that means I was nine years old. Uh, I was born in 2000, 1st of June, and uh, I found myself under the care of a lady who we stayed with her and I knew her as a mother since childhood until I was in class two when I lost her uh, through um, a tragedy, like um, she got sick and she acquired stroke and that led to her death. I was so young by that time. I didn't actually mean, uh, I didn't actually know the meaning of death Actually, also, I didn't, I didn't feel the pain of losing the mom. I felt like everything was okay because people around me, uh, my aunties, my mom's friends, during that um, uh, the period whereby after someone dies till he or she is buried, they were so much into me. They, they were taking good care of me. And actually, I didn't realize that I had lost a mom. Uh, life continued. Uh, now, uh, after class two, that is the time mom died, then class three, class four, I studied at a, at a private school. Then I was, um, I was transferred to a public school when I was in class five, and it was a boarding school. And that was where I ended my primary school schooling. And according to me, that moment and having a child's mind, I thought that me being transferred to a boarding school was a privilege. And I also thought that that was an opportunity because I felt uh, like maybe that time I saw as if I was so much loved, not knowing that I was transferred to a boarding school so that I can be excluded from the family and also, um, to be far apart with the family such that I shouldn't be a bother to them. And yeah, I continued with my studies. I accomplished uh, class eight, but uh, yeah, after my mom's demis, uh, my aunt relocated to our place because our uh, mom was not married. I just knew her only. I didn't have a brother. I didn't have a sister. I was an only child. And yeah, growing up, life was sweet because when my mom was alive, everything I needed was being provided in time. Actually, I never lacked anything. I never lacked emotional support. There is no even a single moment or a single second of time when mom was alive that I felt as if um, I wasn't part of her, nor did I feel that um, I'm in pain because I'm lacking anything because she used to provide each and everything. She could even prefer herself to lack something such that she makes me happy to acquire something. And after she died, life uh, began and took another turn. And yeah, now growing up knowing that no mom is no more, but that, but her death did, had, had not hated me that, yeah, you have lost someone special in your life. And yeah, because we say like one might never feel it, uh, the death's intensity until it robs you of the one you love. But that moment that death, death robbed me, my mom, I didn't feel its intensity until now I, I was in class eight and I was through with school and having been in a boarding primary school, I could really, really wish to have a mom with me watching other students being visited and that particular moment, nobody in my family could come to visit me. Maybe they could say, most of the time they could say, we are busy, we have this, we have to go somewhere. So like they could just send the teacher some cash and tell him or her to go buy some stuff for me, bring me at school and uh, we will meet when we close the schools. So that time, that was the time I came to realize that, oh, actually someone special 
was now away from my life. And that was the time that now it fitted me that I have no one in my life because mom had no husband. Now I didn't have any other person to cry to. And now my aunts had their kids and now they were so much concentrating with their kids more than with me. And um, after I was through with primary school, I was admitted in a, another boarding school, a high school that is Binda Girls, um, where I schooled for the four years. My form one studies were not that much. Um, they were not bad because each and everything was provided, uh, the school fees, everything that a student needs while joining a high school, everything was pro was provided. And yeah, um, I schooled well my first year of high school, also my second year of high school. When, uh, when I was in the third year of high school, that was when uh, now I could feel the, like there was a, a pressure of like being neglected or, uh, People or the family was not seeing me like they started seeing me as a burden. Also, maybe for the fear of now I'm being through with school and I don't know, I couldn't like get it right. What was the reason behind uh, that so much pressure of being like neglected or rejected, how I can call. Um, and yeah. Now they started like the I used to, I used to live with my auntie because she was the one who relocated immediately after my mom died um, and stay with me. Um, now when I was informed that that was the time like now I started to feel that uh, that that pressure of being like an outcast in the family and they could treat me very bad when I cross school when I go home I could feel like yeah I think I do not belong in this place because there's some, there's some kinds of things people can do to you and you feel like really, really, I do not belong here. Or you just compare yourself with other kids and you just imagine that, yeah, because if I was really, really their child or someone who is connected to them, maybe they are not supposed to treat me like this because I used to see my friends who also had lost parents or one parent and they could I could see how their aunties used to take care of them and now my auntie used to tell me that you should thank God. This is a privilege you have, like, because we have, we have not uh, neglected you out there and tell you not to come home or stay away from us or not to come. Or uh, you, you, At least you have a place you can call home and you can come back. Uh, and she could just tell me that I'm one of the persons whereby when you hear me, when you hear me coughing, you should be the first one to ask, what happened to you, auntie? more uh, like uh, like I am the most privileged one and she could tell me you should also be grateful because you have studied in a boarding school and my kids have not gone to a boarding school because she has uh, grown up kids and yeah now I used to stay with that fear and I used to fear not wronging her in any way possible but each and every day she could find something which she could put on me and that telling me you are the reason this happened, you are the reason this happened, this some something is lacking. So this is your this, this this was this this was you who took it. This was you who stored it. This was you who didn't keep it right. You didn't control the children. Like each and every day there are a lot of things happening and I could feel like oh, really, really I don't love staying here. And yeah, when I was in form four now, my last year in high school, um it became worse because now they could even like, after immediately we closed school, they could just send me to one of her daughters such that, and I used to wonder what is the reason, where did I wrong her? And I used to cry day in, day out, nobody, I didn't have anyone to go talk to her, tell her what I'm going through. Like all my life till now, I have just, I have, I have just learned like each and everything, whenever something goes wrong, I should, find a solution myself. I have that fear of asking for help. And uh, yeah, because of how I was treated all my school life days. And after I was through with Form 4, but that year of Form 4, that was the time that my auntie refused to pay my school fees. 
And she said, actually, when it was the, la the last term of that, of that year, in order for me to sit for my KCSE examination, and she told me, like, no, I don't have money to pay for your school fees this term. So what she will do, and that day, my pre our principal sent us home to go and get fees. And I went home and I told her, and she was like, you know what, just go back to school, tell the principal that you are going to get back your books, get your books, come back home, study. Then during the KCP, KC, sorry, KCSC period, you will just go back to school because the government does not allow any high schooler or any person who is sitting for her, his or her primary certificate to be at home. So what she will do, just go get your books and come back home. And that was, that, was, that was what I did. I took my books and I went back home and I stayed for those two months without studying at school. I used to read at home. Then when it was one week before the examinations, that was the time I went back to school. And um, yeah, I did my KCSC and we were through that month and I went back home. Going back home, that was the time now the family saw me as a huge burden. Uh, and like really, really, literally, I was a burden because I saw like each and everything as if I have, and they told me, no, you have to work. No, you are grown up. I cannot take you. My auntie told me I cannot take you any further where you are. That is it. Uh, so if, if, if you want to study, you can pay for your fees or just get married. And yeah, or find work so that you can provide for yourself. And that is what I did. I found somewhere and I was working. Then after some time, I couldn't handle the pressure at work because I was still young and my body could not do the kind of work I had first being employed at. And so I had to go back home and I resigned the work and went back home and I told my auntie that now yeah, I cannot work anymore. By the time I was working, they used to love me. I, I remember even for the first time in my life, someone had called me mom. Like those sweet words parents do call their daughters and also sons. So I felt like, wow, that was the first time. And yeah, and I, I loved it. And after I, re I resigned the job, that was the time now the hell broke up again. And now there was this, there was this, talking behind my back, planning a lot of things with the other aunties and their daughters and their sons. And I was like, oh, I'm so tired. And it felt so terrible. And yeah, I used to cry and just go to my friend's place, talk to her and then go back home in the evening. Uh, I eat, then I sleep. Then the next morning I do my house chores, the part which I was supposed to do. Then I just go back to my friend's house for a whole two months. I couldn't just like stay at home the, during the day or even sleep because each and every time a mistake was being <clears throat> found in me, like you, you went wrong here. And yeah, I was just like, oh my God, until I, I even used to ask my auntie, hey, are you sure that I am one of you? Because I don't think I am connected to you by blood because if I was your sister's daughter, then this would not be happening. And she told me, why, why are you asking such a question? You are ours, you are ours. And I told her, it's okay. But one day when I went to my friend's house, that was the time she told me, I, I, I also asked her the same question as you we were talking. And I asked her, do I look alike like, uh, like any of my auntie's daughters? Because if my mom and my auntie are blood sister, then I should have uh, some characteristics similar to their sons or daughters. And she could be like, no, 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 no. You don't even have the same color. And I was like, hmm. And she told me, or oh, it is because for her, she had heard some rumors in our church because my mom was known by people. And now she told me, I think one day when you were at church and you left me behind, some ladies there were talking to each other. And they said, one of them said, uh, I, I can see that that girl has really, uh, has really grown up. And yeah, she was adopted and she has grown up to be a big, beautiful girl. And so Eunice, my, uh, my friend, did not, did not take that into mind for long. Even when she was telling me, uh, she was just like a by the way. And I told her, by the way, it could be, that could be the reason actually. Maybe it is for me to go and find out. And I kept on pressuring my auntie to tell me, am I yours? Am I connected to you by your blood? 
And one day she just called me and called her sons and daughters because they are grown up. I was like, I'm the younger and she called them and told me that we, have, we will have a family meeting today. And that was the time she told me, um, you have kept, uh, you have been keeping on telling us that, uh, asking me if you are one of us and why we treat you and I personally treat you like that. And she told me, yeah, now I will tell you the truth. You are not one of us. You are not our blood. And I told them what happened, who are my real parents? And she was like, no, we don't know your real parents because your biological mother, the day she gave birth to you, she, um, she kept you by the roadside at a city here, here at Kenya. And she just kept you by the roadside immediately you were born because you were so like even being found uh i was maybe one day old that was immediately maybe after my biological mother had left me by the roadside that was the time and my my auntie told me that um that is what happened and you were seen by people and they took you to the social workers here at Dika and those social workers were the ones uh my mom now my mom who died uh, had already filled in the adoption forms and now a child having been found now the social workers had had to bring me to my late mom uh, when I was one day old and being uh, even for them knowing where I came from it's because when a child is found uh, that date when she's found that is the that is the date that begins to be her birth date and also where she where she was found is written on her arm and um, a casil is just sealed in his or her arm. And that is how I was brought to my mom. So she told me, yeah, you are not our blood and you will never be our blood. And I was like, okay, yeah, it's pained me that time. And yeah, I could feel really, really bad. And I asked them, why, why couldn't you uh, guys have left me? And I start even... Uh, regretting and asking God questions, why me? Then, if 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 my mom died when I was so young, why couldn't you have just made me die during that day that my biological mom neglected me? Why couldn't you have made me die? But but I didn't I didn't ever find answers. And after that, after after them revealing to me the truth. I continued to stay with them for some few months and each and every day they could, my auntie could remind me that you are not our blood. And that thing start, got stuck into my mind that I am not their blood. So that is the reason they treat me so badly. That is the reason they treat me like this. But I was just asking them, why couldn't you have given me other people out here? Because I know people out here stay struggling with kids. Why couldn't you have done that to me? And she could just keep quiet or even pretend she didn't hear me. Yeah, and that is how it went until now. Yeah. Um, telling it again and again makes the story less painful. And I guess that's what we started off majority of us who have also told their stories of childhood pain that's what has happened every day it's less painful and that takes us back to shell's uh, story and uh, world of encouragement tell it share it so maybe before I invite the rest of the audience, uh, Virginia, you remember our topic is, is in childhood trauma, trauma bonding, uh, being one of uh, negative outcomes of childhood trauma. And, and Shell shared about her physical and sexual violence experiences as a child and how she struggled trusting people, trusting colleagues, sometimes even trusting members of the, uh, the church. 
and uh, making it difficult at the workplace, even people who come to you for help, you can be very suspicious. You can be very, very, very anxious around them. Uh, sometimes for someone like uh, Shell, it was a journey all the way to where she is. Virginia is still young. She's a young uh, lady, a young adult. Uh, where hooking up with someone is like the core of Ericsson's human developmental stages. And sometimes this is a stage where uh, abuse can reoccur. And uh, she started by telling us that she fears asking for help. And I think I am a witness to this because uh, she's very close to me in terms of uh, workspace. Uh, and I, I, I am picking a, a girl who is becoming stronger day by day, but I guess there is a time I could see the scare in her eyes. I could see the, um, the fear. I could see some of the signs and symptoms of uh, trauma, trauma bonding. Uh, but maybe before I put out these points out as a wrap up, and give you a chance to ask Virginia a question, I could ask her. Virginia, apart from trying to please the people you called family, do you still find yourself driven to please people? And at times you may not have the energy, sometimes you may not have the ability, sometimes you may not even have the time, <laughs> but you see yourself dying to please. Does it happen, Virginia? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it happens a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, first of all, what I do try to find, what I, what I have been trying to find for so long was a mother figure. And I tried a lot finding a mother figure, trying to look at some ladies, maybe the teachers, maybe some women, maybe some uh, social people who I could see in televisions and I could, I could wish that that person could, may, could be my mom. And also like when I find a lady, I could have tried, like I used to try, especially my teachers when I was in high school, I used to try to like want to, like I, I, don't, I don't want to fail a certain subject I want to keep it on and so that I can please this teacher and uh, so that I can go to, I can get closer to her and he uh, she she mostly a she uh, so that when I have a problem which I don't have anyone at home to share to I could ask that lady questions but I never found one and a lot of people actually have taken uh, that opportunity to uh, to bring me down in a lot of in a lot in a lot of ways, uh, you know, lacking an emotional support system was is one of the biggest like thing I would never wish anyone to go through. And also, like I do try a lot to uh, to uh, it has been a journey and it has been a very um, hard moment for me trying to make friends. I do try to make friends a lot so that at least I can feel I have someone or I have people around me who I can talk to and I can just feel it's okay. So a lot of time I used to find myself trying to please people, maybe actually the same way Dr. Susan you have said, um, I don't have the ability, but I want to make this other person happy so that uh, he or she can, 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 can agree. Uh, let me just use that word because it is not a good word, but let me just use it so that this other person can agree to be in my company or to take me into his or her company, at least I feel so that I can feel I'm secured somewhere. Yeah. Wow. Talking about secure attachment, losing a mother at a tender age and uh, landing into the hands of caregivers, uh, going through some abuse, emotional, psychological, it's not easy for a child and uh, especially the loss. And, and I'm using a case that was already in the public domain of one Brian Shearer, 
uh, the famous TikToker in Kenya. Uh, he kept talking about his mother who died when the young man was eight years old. And you can carry that trauma. And people can even call you into a space that is unsafe. And you get hurt more. Virginia, you're not speaking to just yourself. You are speaking to many. Uh, Maria put it in the chat forum. I went through this. I'm so down in a mess. I lost myself. I have no idea who I am. And I could see her trying to unmute. I wonder if she has something. Uh, but you're free to share. It's okay. But uh, just know we are also recording for the purpose of people who have not been able to join us. So insecure attachment has come out very clearly from Virginia. Uh, and wanting to please people, even when there is nothing you're receiving in return. Wanting to be around people. And I'm going to read out uh, as we wrap up uh, how you know you are a trauma bonding uh, victim. What are these signs and symptoms? Uh, did I see a hand up? Yes, Rosa, I give you three minutes. Rosa, give you a... Thank you, Dr. Susan, and thank you, Ms. Virginia. I just wanted to ask you, um, Ms. Virginia, once you were aware that this is how you were perceiving your situation and perceiving how you are interacting with other individuals, what steps did you actually take to address this um, bonding thing where you, you know, you avoid conflict or um, you avoid situations where you're going to be put down or rejected because I think it's a rejection thing. And so at the end of the day, you don't want to feel rejected. So you don't want to present yourself incorrectly. So you're going overboard in trying to please the other parties, party, singular, plural. And so what steps did you actually take in your help seeking behavior? to ensure that, okay, you're aware that you're bonding with this person incorrectly, uh, or in, you know, not a very healthy way, Sorry. is what I'm saying. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rosa. Uh, what I did, uh, it can be a negative thing, or people, other people can perceive it as a positive one. First, uh, I, I first like get to got to accept that yeah um you have no one in your life and for real nobody is willing to take care of you or nobody is there to show you love so you will have to find love on your own way and to find peace and to create peace with you with myself I alone. What I did first, I, I withdrew myself from a lot of relationships and I could just try harder and harder. When I, uh, when I was about like, uh, I was like trying to get into, into a relationship with um, like a friendly relationship with someone and I see how he or she is behaving. Now I used to tell myself that, now for me to, when uh, the part of withdrawing myself from a lot of friendship was uh, now remembering what I did to you and how you didn't give back to me what I wanted. And so I kept that in mind that, you see, you, you went to her and you did this to her, but this is what she did to you. That is not a good friend. Like now I kept on uh, having a negative mind on that or of that person so that I can feel that like, uh, I can just, it is not like generating hatred, but to end that, that, that kind of feeling or being attached to that someone. So I used to withdraw myself a lot from, and that is actually, till now I have less friends because I withdrew myself from a lot of relationships. And also in order to avoid conflict with anyone, I, I could, I, I used to take small, small steps whereby someone cannot realize that uh, I'm getting away or I'm running out of this relationship. So I used to try like, 
uh, if we used to talk more on phone or if we used to talk more in physical, now I begin to make myself busy with something else such that when this person calls on, or when this person wants us to meet or when this person wants us to, wants me to visit her place, I could just tell her that, oh no, kindly I'm busy this particular moment, maybe next time. And that's how uh, it's, that's how I did a lot of relationships until uh, they came to an end. That It is not an end, but they became now like an official friendship whereby it is like when we meet in the way, it's like, hi, hi, how are you doing? I'm good, that way, that way. And also um, bonding, bonding with people, it has been, of late, it has been so, 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 it has been so um, hard for me because each and every time when I see someone trying to be to befriend me or wanting to be my friend, I fear because I, I, I'm like, huh, you want me to, to become friends with you so that at the end you come to hurt me again, just like someone this, this someone did to me. And I would do myself also by being mindful of what and how I feel, um, then acting on what I intend to improve on, like if something I want to improve uh, on being a certain being, maybe it is I do modeling and I can say maybe I want to train others on modeling, there are some steps. So I just intend, I just uh, started acting more and improving what I love to do and avoided myself more in people's uh, um, friendship things, yeah. Thank you, Miss Virginia. Wow, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm very happy because Virginia is now currently doing her diploma in counseling psychology, doing a lot of classes in um in self awareness and personal development, and uh, I can also attest day in day out, uh, she's creating boundaries. Um, any other question for Miss Virginia? Any other question? We have like 24 minutes to end in our session. Any question, any comment? Virginia grew up knowing that a caregiver was a biological mother and that was not the case. And so when her biological uh, mother gave birth to her, uh, dumped her by the roadside. And uh, those those days, you only used to go to the social services department if you wanted to adopt a child. And you could tell them if you find a child that is uh, thrown by the roadside, uh, kindly let me know. I think I grew up in that era in my country. I know Shell and Yinka there, your story is different, uh, maybe for many centuries in the USA, but I grew up in that era. If you needed a child, you only need to give details, they would get to know you. Uh, and and you could, ad uh, if you adopt uh, a boy, then you must adopt a boy maybe with a girl. Because there are many families I knew as I was growing up who had adopted a boy and a girl or just a, a girl. And so, uh, that mother was kind to Virginia and she gave the best to Virginia and all along she did not know that uh, maybe the guardian, the sister to the, to the mother the, the, the foster mother of a, a I would talk about the foster mother she did not know and even for a long time, he used to call her grandma. You can pick that confusion of identity. Uh, and later on, them dropping the bombshell. You do not belong here. And you can you can imagine even right now, Virginia, is it easy to go there after knowing this truth and all this mistreatment? Is it easy to visit? How do you relate with them? Thank you. Um, on my side, it has never been easy um, because uh, 
even after I left that place and I visited once or twice, as I can remember, uh, and my visit was through the church whereby I could go back to our church because I didn't feel I didn't feel uh, like I should leave the church because I have left home, because I have duties there, I have leadership authority in our church in many departments, and now I could feel it's so bad because these people, uh, these uh, people choose you to be their leader, but situation could not make me go back. And so the, 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 two, the two times I visited, uh, the first time yeah, I went back home, and everything was just okay. But now when I went home, what the what my auntie needed the most was money. You see? And she could just be like, You have come home, yeah, you brought shopping, but I need money, I need cash. And so I was like, Oh my God. And the second time I went to church. So I I, I used to visit the church first, then after church I go home and see my aunties and the siblings there. And yeah, when I went the second time, uh, I was just at church and she just, my auntie just passed me on the entrance while she was leaving for home. And I was like, did I do something wrong? Because I even tried to approach her and uh, and just like ask her, how is you? How are you doing? Can we head home together? But when I just greeted her, I do call her Shosho. So I, call, I, so I asked her Shosho and she just looked at me and just walked away and I was I felt something negative and I felt something wasn't right and so I decided for the better for the betterment of me let me just leave and not go home today maybe I can visit the next time or maybe she will call me but it has been tough I have not been visiting home I even don't feel because I feel like when I go there anger will just stroke and just take the the best of me and uh, I just feel like it is not right also going there because even for them, they have never tried finding out where did I go? Who am I with? Am I safe? It has been long and nobody really, really cares about me. Wow. So Shell has written to you, Miss Virginia, thank you so much for sharing. I'm working with a young lady right now, suffering with abandonment, and your sharing will help me reach her. So you are already an encouragement far and beyond the horizons uh, of Africa. So Asante Sana. So maybe one last question from me and then we go to Nora. Uh, do you ever wish to know your real mother? Um, yeah. Uh... I do not, I, I really, I, I wish, I, I actually wish a lot to know who my real mom is because I believe that um, I being a lady and having seen uh, how ladies act and how women act uh, when they are near their children, uh, I really wish to find if my, my, if my biological mom is still alive, I don't know the reason, behind her dumping me maybe she had a lot of kids and now she couldn't you know when when even I was growing up with my late mom I could say I could I could feel like maybe I'm not yes I could I, I had that feeling of not being one of them since I was at I was young because I could feel I could even ask myself maybe my mom had a daughter and this daughter died and now the daughter having died now me I was left with the grandmother so that is the reason mama take care of me but now coming to find out that I'm not even part of their family, I really wish to know my real mom. If uh, if I could get a chance uh, through God's will and I find that she's still alive, I will appreciate her because I don't know the reason behind her uh, uh, doing the action she did. And each and every person is a human and we have our own weaknesses and the reason behind us doing each and everything. So I don't have a problem with me finding her or not finding her. But if she's still alive, I would love to see her. I would love to feel that mothery thing that I have never felt. Wow. I'm liking the way you're saying, I don't know the reason. And I think that puts somebody in a safer space. Uh, Saada tells you just a world of encouragement. It gets better with time. Yes, 
but the journey can be faster with a professional and of course God. Linda Githura, thank you for coming into the house. And you're telling uh, Virginia, thanks for sharing your painful story, Virginia. This is a difficulty, a difficult journey to navigate. I am proud of you for pressing on and wish you the very best. All this is coming for you, Virginia. Uh, and I can ask Nora Nyongesa. Nora, thank you. You came all the way from Nyeri to be part of this big launch. Uh, Pain to Fruitfulness Mental Health Talk Show. And here you are with us in our episode two. Karibu Sana. Welcome. Thank you so much. For me, um, I'd congratulate you, Virginia, for sharing your story. I never saw it ending that way. Even up to now, I'm not even able to comprehend. So it, it still speaks that God's grace surpasses all human understanding. And also to comment, I've, I've noted that when you became, when you're in form two to form three, that's when you started discovering like you are different, things are different. And one of the questions that I wanted to ask Dr. Susan has asked you, like when you go back, but as somebody also has commended, it gets better as, as you continue. So I um, keep on wondering, like in these aspects, like as you've heard, Dr. Susan has said, I work in Nyeri. So even when I'm in Nyeri, when I get sick, I really feel if I wish to be at home, I, as old as I am, I am almost fourth floor, but as old as I am, I wish to be home. I wish to be at my mom's place. I wish to be with my siblings. So I don't know for you, I don't know if it causes triggers, but if you're okay answering, it's okay. If you're not, it's also okay. So I don't know if such moments reach where like you really need your family around as much as those people have really done you so bad. I don't know if it reaches some time you feel like I really, I really want to go home. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. Yeah, just like everybody else or anybody else, um, home is always, home is always the best and having a home is good, but having a family is the best thing. Having like, I really do miss because even though uh, they cost me a lot of pain, I, 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 I do forgive them. Actually, I forgave them a long time ago and that does not bother me anymore because I just, I don't know why, but just God gave me another, uh, another feeling of just like, I even like stay like for three weeks. Then I could remember, oh, Virginia, you had you had someone you used to call home. What happened to you? And could, I could just laugh at myself because I was just even wondering, God, how did you do such a thing? Like, how, how did you give me such peace of mind such that I don't bother if anyone calls me or seeks me out or not? I'm just there. I'm just living. And yeah, it, but I know it is a good thing. And I also would wish to have a family whereby I can just go home, you know, being at home or having a family near you and um, just talking and speaking your mind up. It's a good feeling. And yeah, sometimes I wish to have a family, like, uh, like I wish going back home, but then I remember the pain, the pain and the struggles and everything that I went through that place. And I just feel like, no. And I remember one time, I think so last month, I met my aunt, my aunt's daughter, and she told me that, yeah, Joki, you should go back home even though people wronged you. And I just thought I don't have a problem with anyone, but uh, I feel it is good to be where I am and to stay alone. And and uh, and she told me, you know, even after 10 years, you, you can still go back home because that is where you know is home. And I told her, you know, nobody should tell me even after 10 years because it is what my heart holds. I don't hold any grudges with anyone, but I will never wish to go through pain again. And I just told God, bless me so that even those people who neglected me and discriminated me, they will be there to receive my blessings because no matter what someone does to me, whether bad 
uh, right or wrong. I don't take it to heart. I just like let it be. And yeah, I would, I would just help everyone. Even that auntie who did those things to me, I still love her. And when, I ha when I'm able to help her, when, I, when God blesses me and I get the ability, I will still continue helping her in each and every way I could because she's still a human and I'm still a human. Yeah. Uh, Virginia, young, lovely, compassionate already. And so many uh, messages are coming in. Susan Jorogie, a counselor and a marriage and family therapist specialist, is saying thanks for opening up. It's a healing process. God bless you. Uh, Sada writes, triggers happen all the time. I have a mother who is incapable of saying that she loves me back. It hurts and it's hilarious for me as well. A painful humor. For me, home is my house. I pray for her because I fear it's her loss, not mine, really. Um, Jane says, thank you so much, Virginia, for your touching story. It's encouraging for your inspiration to many hearts. Yes. And, um, oh, Shell, thank you. I see your hand up. I want to give you this chance to say something. Welcome, Shell. Um, Virginia, I thank you. Uh, Virginia, I wanted to say two things. And again, um, I'm driving and I apologize for the noise, but you really touched me when you said that you had to learn to forgive. Because part of trauma is the thing, the person, the circumstance, you have to get to that place of forgiveness. That's how you heal. So it, it it's amazing that such at a, such a young age that your maturity level was to say, I, I have to forgive these people. I can't let them control me. And I mean, it's just amazing. You are such an amazing young lady. And um, God is really using you for sharing your story with so many people. Um, I am recording the um, audio because I want to send it to the young lady that I uh, um, I was telling you about. It, it's just that forgiveness will hold us back if we can't learn to get rid of it. If we can't learn to get rid of the bitterness and the resentment, it will hinder us in our healing. So thank you so much. Oh, wow. Young and ready to forgive. And, and and that's Virginia. She likes to bounce back even after a difficult moment. Um, I have seen all what she's been saying. Uh, Sada still tells you it'll be okay. I know you will because I have. You keep going, especially because you have forgiven. Letting go. So as I wrap up, uh, it's good to remind ourselves that childhood trauma uh, leads to very severe insecure attachment issues. Somebody keeps longing to belong and sometimes there's nowhere to belong. That sense of insecurity comes with fear of being rejected. And so you go out to keep uh, pleasing people. Uh, sometimes uh, if you want to know that childhood trauma really uh, caused pain, that fear of asking for help, that I have seen in Virginia. And so uh, those of my colleagues that are here, I'm sure you are now learning a thing or two. Thank you, Emmanuel, for being a very strong pillar. Uh, thank you, Ian, as well, for being a very strong pillar. Thank you, Jen. Most of the time you are with Virginia at the office and uh, many others. Thank you, Francis, also uh, for being a pillar. So Virginia has found a home uh, at Susan Gitao Counseling Foundation, but that is not enough. Uh, sometimes telling her story this way uh, has opened up uh, people's minds and people's hearts. Uh, my desire is to spread compassion uh, so that people can travel light in this world 
and out of this world. So if any one of us is here and you want to help people with trauma bonding, uh, just remember trauma bonding will mostly be pronounced when you have an abuser and the person be abused being in a relationship. And so if we would love to protect children who have suffered from traumatic experiences in childhood, from tra trauma bonding in future, then we need to uh, encourage or provide an environment that is loving, an environment that is safe, an environment that is secure, an environment that is encouraging. There could be all what there is, but if you have a child who has gone through trauma and they feel safe with you, they feel non-judged, they feel secure with you, Sometimes you don't even need to give them those material things that people talk about. They will actually day by day grow. So if you want to know those children as adults, sometimes they long for affection that is not available. They fear leaving those people they are seeking affection from. Sometimes they have no boundaries and anyone can come in and abuse them whether they are physical boundaries, emotional boundaries, sometimes they allow, but it's not because they want to, they want to belong. So you can imagine now when they get into romantic relationships, all along maybe you have gotten into a romantic relationship. This is the age, and especially the very many young ones who are here, and maybe some of us, that we see as survivors of childhood trauma, you find that there is loss of sense of worth, sense of confidence, sense of self. So this other person now fills in those spaces for you and they can turn you around the way they want because you're so afraid of being abandoned. You're so afraid of being left out. You want to belong. And you fear if you leave this person, you will be disconnected from what sometimes you cannot even tell. You will feel isolated. You will feel lost. And with the time, you develop permanent shame. And of course, shame of even doing what is good for you. Shame of trying. And so we have many, many young people especially when they are getting into romantic relationships that are meant to lead into marriage. They wonder, it was so bad for me in childhood. How come I am in another relationship that is so abusive? What's wrong with me? I must be the problem. So you can imagine you are hurting, you've been abused in a relationship, and you keep blaming yourself. And because you find yourself as the one who is at fault, you are the problem, you feel stuck in a relationship that you can actually not leave. Imagine that kind of a prison. So you get stuck in relationships that are abusive, exploitative. And when you are in this kind of a relationship, a trauma-bonded relationship, you're always walking on eggshells around the abuser. Maybe if I do this, maybe I say this, they're going to do this. They're going to, you know, kick me out. I don't know if they kick me out. Where will I go? Mm -hmm. And that is how the cycle of violence also continues. But for how long can you stay there? It depends from one person to another. But I want to repeat those words from Shell and Yinka and Nora, and others who have written that you have to be willing to seek help. And getting help from a professional, you become very vulnerable to them because if you deal with it, then you can heal it. And so those of us who are parents, who are teachers in the house, we are having these people in our midst. We are having these children. We are having these 
students, we are having these colleagues in our midst, and we have seen even the cases of femicide in my country, Kenya. I'm not sure about Rwanda. I'm not sure about Nigeria. I'm not sure about USA. But there are these increasing cases of femicide, intentional killing of the female gender by the male gender. And if you look at most of those women that die in those marriages, in those relationships, they have what we have just described, trauma bonding challenges. Just look at that young woman, young man, and see them as a little boy, as a little child. And as counselors, we are called to create that ideal situation in our therapy rooms where we can create a stable environment, a loving environment, a caring environment, a safe environment, so that all of us can walk this journey of love, the journey of self-compassion. It's been a great pleasure having all of you in this session and having Shell coming in, uh, Yinka Perry coming in, and many others joining us from outside Kenya. Dr. Rosa, you promised you'll never leave us, and here we are seeing you. We really appreciate you. And I know the conversation of uh, adding all forms of sexual and gender-based violence will continue with your engagement with us going forward. Uh, very many people have joined in and you have been patient for two hours. I want to thank you very much. Don't forget this is P2F, Pain to Fruitfulness, hosted by Dr. Susan Gitao. And of course, support, big support from Susan Gitao Counseling Foundation. You are a blessing to us. You are an amazing, amazing partner by joining in, participating, sharing this knowledge. You are taking a very big portion of helping to heal the world using mental health skills, mental health partners, and mental health practitioners. Asante Sana, and because Virginia has been one of the the keynote speakers. I don't want to leave her hand hanging there. So before we get a prayer, I would like to invite Virginia. Virginia, you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, thank you all for attending our meeting tonight. It is a privilege. We are so honored. I will feel so bad if I leave this meeting without recognizing Dr. Susan Gitao. She has been such a great mom to me. And yeah, I think even the, I should now, I should never call myself again an orphan. She has been a great mama to me. She has shown me love, each and everything I need. She has been providing to me. So at least I have a mom and I have, and she made her family be my family. I'm so honored, Dr. Susan, may God bless you and your family. Thank you. Thank you so much, Virginia. You're a loving person. And you're going far, very, very far, very far, very far. That I can attest. Uh, it's, it's not easy. I'm happy today. The chapter you have opened is a chapter that, uh, because this story with your permission and consent is going to go to many people. Let's see what the Lord can do. Uh, let's see the unfolding of your story and being backed by the video that Shell has shared with us. We are also learning a lot, a lot, a lot. So I do not want you to leave this space with some pent up emotions and you've been tired. So I would like you to sit up, upright position. I'm using me, you don't have to open your video, but I am using myself. Uh, Self-compassion is a journey I take on a daily basis, and it is a journey that has been amazing, amazing. I can see Janvier here. He's going to be our host with MHub. Uh, Janvier, are you ready for us in Rwanda? Yes, 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 you are ready. <laughs> yeah, we are going to Rwanda at a time when they are commemorating their 30th 
uh, genocide against the Tutsis. And uh, I thank God I started doing Rwanda in 2010. Then from 2012, I started taking counselors there until COVID came, we have gone back. And this time we, we grow every day because this is going to be our second training and retreat and a wider uh, opportunity to tour Rwanda and to be with our brothers and sisters in Rwanda. The month of April is the month that Rwanda can never forget. We have uh, 100 million uh, people lost their lives as the world watched. And so it's, it's also a challenge for us as counselors. Uh, who is dying under your watch? Who is suffering under your watch? Is there something you can do? Even if it's spreading some little kindness, it is spreading a world of encouragement. It is spreading a world of enlightenment because you sharing knowledge and information can help someone. So you can take your position, sitting or standing, and uh, you can slowly, you can wish to close your eyes or keep them open or partially open. And you can take slow, deep breaths. And this is how you breathe in, using your nose tree and holding your breath a little bit and then releasing it through the mouth. Taking another slow, deep breath, breathing. Hold it, hold it, hold it, and let it out. Let it out. Let it out. And take another deep breath. Breathe in through the nostril, in, in, and in. Hold it, hold it, and hold it. And out. And out. And out. The breath of life. Breath of life, breath of life. One more time, and as you breathe in this time, remind yourself of one big lesson from our presentation today. And remind yourself, you are one part of the big universe. There is a contribution you can make. There is no big or small contribution. That's the best that you can do. Let's go one last time, breathing in, in, and in, and hold, hold, and hold, and out, out. Out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You have been a wonderful God. We are sharing about trauma bonding at a time when we are also going to celebrate the rising from the dead of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Reminding us of the trauma the disciples, the immediate family went through. And yet out of it, fruitfulness to salvation. Thank you for the vision that you gave about pain to fruitfulness. So many stories in the world. Stories of pain, stories of shame, stories of murder, stories of hate. 
leading to serious mental health concerns are yet to be told on this platform. Thank you that this family has grown big because people asked, yes, you will have physical P2F shows. What about the online shows? And Father, this is a confirmation. Within two days, we advertised. With more days, we can reach out to more people. I appeal to the professional counselors in this platform to make this vibrant and active so that the more we share, the more we hear, because this is another platform. We can grow together. We can support one another. Social media has been used to spread hate, spread homophobia, spread stigma and discrimination. Father, you have called us on a different assignment and with a different heart, looking at everyone as your own creation. Help us to learn from Jesus. During his era, many people were disregarded as equal to others. And he stood up because he was with you. Help us to stand up for the less marginalized, the minority groups in our midst, abandoned children, neglected young adults, and especially the youths in Africa, who most of the time walk around without mentors, without parental care, and we look at them in disgust. We look at them as people with misbehavior. And yet deep down, they could be carrying the same, same scars that some of us carried until we dealt with it. So I speak a blessing over each one of us in this platform and our families. A lot of pain we carry. Some pain we have never spoken. Some pain might never be spoken to another person. But to you, Father in heaven, and the Holy Spirit in our midst, we give you that pain. We give you that pain. We place under your guidance and care the upcoming trip retreat training of mindful self-compassion to Rwanda. So that when we get there, Father, sometimes we don't know how, but when we release ourselves to you, you are a Father that changes not. You create a stable, caring, loving platform. May we ape you. May we desire to be like you on a daily basis. Walk with us. And when we fall, rise with us. And when we err, let us remember you are ever forgiven. And let us remember to always forgive those people that have pained us so that our burdens can be lighter and our journey can be shorter. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. Yeah. Thank you.